Corsair 82 has gone active. Classification Air 82, surface hostile warship. Attention in the section tracking party. Party Sierra 82, the contact of interest has been classified as a hostile surface warship. Chief of the Watch, man battle stations. Man battle stations. Take charge of the place, you got that. 150 feet. Man battle stations. Right, stations. Attention in the fire control tracking party. Intelligence from sonar indicates that Sierra 82 is making 129s. All stations evaluate for a speed of 129s. Carry on. Ever since there has been war at sea, sailors and inventors have dreamed of making a craft that would operate deep below the surface. Somewhere in the expanse of the Pacific Ocean is USS Honolulu, a Los Angeles-class attack submarine. Today, the submarine is the ultimate weapon. Once an impossible dream, she has progressed from an instrument of the underdog to a nuclear-powered leviathan, free to roam her watery kingdom as ruler of all above and below the waves. Bearing, mark, 6.1, now let's go. The modern submarine can slip silently and secretly into troubled waters, eavesdropping off foreign shores, using stealth as her greatest asset. Fighting point procedures, master one, tube two. Stand by. Stand by. Stand by. Shoot. Shoot two, two. The unit is running. The wire is good. Only in attack does the submarine reveal itself before creeping away to the concealment of the deep. It was in 1776 that the dream of a submarine became a reality. A clam-shaped vessel called Turtle carried out the first attack ever recorded by a submersible. It was during the Revolutionary War, and it was a desperate effort by colonist David Bushnell to humble the British Navy. At the Boat Museum in Essex, Connecticut, a working replica of Turtle has been constructed and tested by two enthusiasts, Joe Leary and Fred Frisay. Joe had the four-page description that uh, David Bushnell wrote to Thomas Jefferson on what the submarine was and how it was constructed. And from that four-page description, we went and built the boat. The basic principle of the submarine is that you want to take your vessel and have it weigh exactly as much as the same sized and shaped parcel of water would weigh. Now, in order to make the submarine work, your boat has to be able to be both lighter and heavier than that amount of water. And the way that we do that is by having a, a great deal of lead in the boat. Because obviously, you look at this, this is a wooden submarine and wood is buoyant. It encloses a big bubble of air and air is buoyant and it encloses me, and I am buoyant. So naturally what you've got to do is have something that'll push all that, that'll make it less buoyant and make it submerge. This is the exact same principles that you have in a modern Trident submarine, in a modern Seawolf class submarine. Nothing has changed whatsoever. The reconstructors faced exactly the same problem as David Bushnell. How much time could they spend submerged? On one of our dives, I took it out to the center of this pool we were using. I dropped it down to the bottom, and I just sat there. And we had no problem being down for an hour. You can have shorter dives, though, where you're spinning the propeller and working the pumps, where you'll exhaust the air in a lot less time than that. And that leads to a couple of problems. And the first one is your atmosphere is closed. The hatch is secure. You're not going to get any more air from anywhere else. So you have the twin problems of, of using up all of the oxygen but also of carbon dioxide buildup. You know, in modern submarines, they have lithium hydroxide canisters. They absorb the CO2 in any number of ways. Here, there's just no option. 
In 1776, an army sergeant was selected to carry out the attack on the British Navy moored in New York Harbor. It was one man and a hand-powered barrel against the world's most powerful Navy. All the operator Ezra Lee had to do was place an explosive device beneath their flagship. What he probably did was submerge himself beneath the boat, pump the water out of the ballast tank and drive the spike into the bottom of the ship and then flood himself down again and break away the shaft, release the mine and get away from it. Ezra Lee did get underneath the boat. He did manage to get the screw smacked up against the bottom of the boat, but unfortunately struck one of the iron braces that is associated with the pintle and the rudder assembly and bounced off. Well, what Lee found was he came up alongside the boat. Suddenly he went from hunter to hunted and spent the rest of that night trying to get away. Well, the fact of the matter is no one knows what boat he attacked that night. We've been all over the public records office of the Admiralty, and no one has any indication that there was a submarine attack at that time. Now, when you think about it, this is one of the most remarkable, dramatic things that ever happened in the history of, of, of naval combat. And there's no one like the British in terms of, you know, monopolizing the great advantages in naval combat. And yet I have this image that they're standing there on their decks, almost like the dinosaurs looking down in condescension at the little mammals that are taking away their eggs. They had no concept that the world was changing fundamentally at that moment in that spot. It was the U.S. Civil War that witnessed the next submarine attack, almost 100 years after Bushnell's turtle. It was still a weapon of the underdog. The submersible was the Confederate's CSS Hunley, named after her key financial backer, Horace Hunley. The target, the Union ship, USS Housatonic. The Hunley basically was a machine of desperation. Think of the mid-19th century going out in the middle of the night in a submarine. Uh, even, even after all these years of research, still the, the, just the, the ring of Confederate submarine just isn't supposed to be there. It just doesn't sound right. There's just something wrong about it. Submarines are supposed to be in their infancy in World War I, and here we have one that actually sunk a ship 50 years before then. On the drawing board, the Hunley was to be powered by batteries. But in 1863, the technology wasn't ready and was replaced by eight men cranking the propeller. They had serious problems virtually from the beginning. One of the first efforts led to the loss of life of five out of the nine-man crew. Uh, this was in September 1863. Then in October, uh, a a second tragedy occurred when Horace Hunley, for reasons we don't even know, took command of the submarine himself, went out. He had no experience in this sort of thing. He evidently uh, hit the lever that let water into the ballast box. It plunged to the bottom, bow first, stuck in the mud, and the whole crew of nine died. Surprisingly, General Beauregard agreed to a third trial, and surprisingly, one could still obtain volunteers to go on board. Our intelligence tells us the Federal fleet is massing in this area off of Rattlesnake Cove. I want you to take the Hunley out and reconnoiter that area. What is the tides in this area this time? The attack was planned for February 17th, 1864. Lieutenant George E. Dixon would direct his eight-man crew to ram the Union 